Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back, uh, everyone, for another and final uh, halakha for the upholders of justice series that we're doing here at Muslim Space. Alhamdulillah, it's uh, been, you know, five, oh, this is now our fifth halakha, and uh, we're um, so glad to have been able to go through this experience, as sad as we are to uh, bid it goodbye. Alhamdulillah, we're really excited for the topic that we are closing out with, uh, which is environmental justice in Islam. Uh, my name is Osama, and I'm serving as the resident chaplain for Muslim Space. Uh, and as you uh, already know a little bit about Muslim Space, that uh, we are a community organization serving the greater Austin area. We're striving to provide an open, welcoming environment to all self-identifying Muslims, as well as those who are connected to or interested in Islam, uh, who wish to gather, unite, and support one another through various programming and community events. And since the pandemic, we've actually aimed to make our events and activities even more accessible. Uh, and we've had folks participate from uh, across the globe and across the country. And so, inshallah, as I mentioned, we make it really uh, a point to be an inclusive and welcoming space uh, where all are invited, regardless of their difference in faith, gender, orientation, uh, race, or any other difference. Uh, a little bit of background on the series before I introduce our speaker here. The Upholders of Justice series, uh, as we're on our final halakha today, uh, was a series and is a series that uh, lifts up the context, uh, the concept of justice, uh, not just in the context that we might know it in the sense of social justice or activism, but also uh, a justice that is uh, a divinely imbued justice. Uh, the Quran tells us that Muslims are enjoined not just to be just, but to be upholders of justice, uh, even if it is against themselves, as stated in the Quran, uh, that, O oh, ye who believe, be persistently uh, in standing firm for justice, be witnesses for Allah, even if it's against yourselves, or your parents, or your relatives, whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not your personal inclin inclinations, lest you uh, not be just. And if you distort uh, or refuse, then indeed Allah is ever aware of what you do. And so for this specific halakha, as I mentioned, we're going to be diving into a concept uh, that we are familiar with in many other, in many different circles and discourses, uh, but maybe not as familiar with when it comes to Islam and the intersection of environmental justice. And so uh, this series is going to be recorded. It's being recorded to YouTube and to Facebook. Uh, inshallah, will be accessible for all who could not make it today. But we welcome those of you who are uh, joining us via the live stream or those of you who may be uh, attending in the future, inshallah. Just a reminder for those of you who are here or in the live stream uh, to remain muted until uh, we have the question period at the end. Uh, at the end, If any questions do come up, please put them in the chat and we'll be happy to address them there. And please keep discourse respectful to the speaker and the attendees. Uh, we'll be having uh, an organization member just keep an eye on that, but uh, we want to make sure that this space remains a safe and open space. And if there's any concerns at any point, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this awesome topic of environmental justice in Islam. So Corey Majid, Sister Corey Majid, has used her Green Ramadan platform to encourage Muslims to eat mindfully and to tread lightly by cultivating sustainable habits during Ramadan since 2013. These habits are based on Islamic teachings and principles that call humanity to give all of Allah's creation their rights. Corey is a Green Faith Fellow, a Master Watershed uh, Stewart, uh, Stewart, and a Muhammad Ali Scholar at Bayan Islamic Graduate School and co-chair of the Green Team at Masjid Muhammad, the nation's mosque uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Corey is also a co-author of the, uh, the book, uh, 40 Green Hadith, uh, which we'll drop a link to in the chat uh, and have uh, have y'all access there. Um, but without further ado, uh, Sister Corey, uh, we'd love to uh, have you uh, come to the space and please let us know uh, what, 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 what we need to know about environmental justice in Islam. It's great to have you back again. Thank you so much for inviting me back. So, I, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam ala rasulullah. So, I just want to go over um, the ayah again. O oh, you, oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is worthy of both. 
And it goes on, so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed Allah is ever of what you do aware. And so I was looking at uh, some of the different translations of, uh, of the ayah and where it said, be consistently, be persistently standing firm. Other words that were used were custodians or upholders. And when we talk about being witnesses for Allah, that means for the sake of Allah. And this is a, an uprightness and a, a resoluteness and a guardianship that must be just and, and true and not leaving any, any truths out or, or changing the truth. So, and when it talks about, even if it be against yourselves, that means that to me that the application of the justice may be may seem to be pers personally affecting us negatively but uh, Allah you know promises relief to those who obey so we have the ayah uh, for indeed with hardship will be ease and uh, the part that says, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives, whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So in that I see us preferring justice over ourselves, our parents, our relatives, whether we or our parents or our relatives are rich or poor. So the rich may use their influence to get their version of justice and we may want to bend the rules a bit to get our version of justice for the poor. But Allah is the protector of us all. Allah is the protector of, of us, our parents, our relatives, the rich and the poor. Our preference should be Allah's will rather than our desires or our whims. Allah's will is justice, right? Allah is the most, of, uh, most aware of um, the particular needs of every single soul. And Allah is the most capable of fulfilling those needs. Our knowledge is, is so limited. So our best bet is to stand for justice, to be upholders for justice. And one of the essential ways of being uh, an upholder of justice is to understand and embody our roles as servants of Allah. And this is this might look like a tangent that I'm about to go into, but it's gonna eventually come back around to, to being an up, upholder of justice. So just stay with me real quick. So Thursday at our house is usually movie night. And um, it used to be African dance night, but you know, COVID. So now Thursdays are movie night, our movie night at our house. And I usually watch like Nigerian flicks or uh, flicks from South Africa and like Korean movies. But then I saw a preview for a movie that's pretty popular right now. It's been, been popular for a while. And the movie um, that I saw a preview for was, is called Don't Look Up. So, um, you know, I was intrigued. And for those who haven't seen the movie, um, I'll give you a quick synopsis. Um, an, an astronomy grad student and her professor, they discover that a comet is in direct collision uh, with Earth, right? And they desperately try to warn the US government and use the media to get it out to the masses that we as a planet have just six months to live before this comet comes crashing down and uh, extinguishing life on earth. But everyone responds to their announcement with disbelief or indifference. So many people see this movie as an allegory for the climate crisis and, and the many ways that humans have come up with uh, with uh, 
possible ways of extinguishing humanity. So besides the climate crisis, we've got, we've created nuclear weapons, we've created artificial intelligence that might become sentient and turn on us. And we've also created, you know, pandemics. So this comet colliding to the earth, that's an extinction level event, right? We can, in six months, you know, the earth was destroyed in this movie. Climate crisis is, is less immediate. It's a slower moving extinction level event, but, you know, we see the signs that the, the, the pace of climate crisis is increasing, right? And then we have the extinction level event for everybody. And that is the day of judgment. And there are many signs, although only Allah knows when it will occur, but Allah has promised that it will inevitably happen, right? So, and, and don't look up, people, this is a little bit of a spoiler, people are able to escape from the extinction level event in that movie. So it's, it's a movie, movies allow us to like, temporarily to suspend our belief and, and reality. And in Don't Look Up, a few probably very rich people were able to escape from Earth via spacecraft to go to another planet. And my point is these people escaped, but their mindset travel light years with them. So there's, there's a tech guru in the movie. He still relies on technology rather than God. And we have a, a president who was able to escape and she still acts like she's in control of all things around her rather than relying on God. And the movie ends there. Uh, we don't know if they survive on this new planet, but let's just say they do. All these people did was take their mindsets, their way of being from one planet to another. So most likely humans being what they are, they will repeat that the cycle of devastation that ended planet earth, right? So we've only got one planet. Um, I believe that we can save this planet through a, a, a change of heart, through a, a reconnection with Allah and with nature and by standing for justice, even if it is against our own selves. I believe that our current ecological crisis is, is both the result of humanity's collective action and, but more importantly, I believe that our ecological crisis is a reflection of humanity's inner state. So we have to change our perspective of the natural world from one of invasion and subjugation and, and violence. And the most effective way to be at peace with nature is to achieve peace within. Our, our natural world is, is, is no longer sacred. It, it's, it's something to be conquered and used and thrown away. It's unfortunate to say, but um, we use our world like a prostitute. And progress is, 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 is considered equivalent to the domination of nature or at least progress is built on nature's complete subjugation. This is one of the symptoms of the, the disconnect and the imbalance between humanity and nature. And this disconnect will, will bring out humanity's own demise. Humanity's domination over nature is, is, is compounded with a belief in humanity's unlimited power and, and possibilities. And who, who, 
there's only one who has unlimited power and possibilities. We're, we're essentially thinking that we are that we are Allah, right? And every everywhere around us, we see um, humanity trying to conquer the skies with planes and spaceships and triumph over the land with like high speed vehicles and, and, and towering buildings and, and, and subdue the seas with, with submarines and like massive ships. And there's, there's an imbalance with nature uh, and it's expressed by humanity trying to battle it rather, rather than um, collaborate with it. So humanity and nature, they're out of balance. And this imbalance between the relationship between humanity and nature is caused by humanity's estranged relationship with Allah. So, so how can we address the, the spiritual crisis that is presenting itself as a climate crisis? And I offer you two things, Tawheed, and Mizan. Tawheed is, is unity, the oneness of Allah. So to be just, to be truly just, we have to understand Tawheed. In understanding Tawheed, we know who we are in relationship to the ultimate reality, Allah. And um, I recently took, um, I think it was like a 12 week course with Ramis Kent on uh, Islam and sustainability and stewardship. And he, he, told, he told us about many amazing things, but one of them was like the three purposes of humanity according to Ibn Adam. And the first was worship, ibadah. And this is, a, this is what worship really does. And this is such an amazing thing. What worship really does is it creates people into people who do the greatest good. That is what worship is. It's, it's not a bunch of rules, do this and do this and do that. It is, it, it is a way of fashioning people into do people and, and fashioning people into people who do the greatest good. I think that is such a refreshing way to think of worship. And the second thing, uh, the second purpose of humanity, according to Ibn Arabi, is imara or cultivation of the earth. And the third is khalifa or stewardship. And this type of stewardship is such that all of creation benefits from your presence. So if you have, uh, if you have all of creation benefiting from your presence, you want to have a big footprint, right? You know, you're not trying to minimize your footprint because your 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 presence and your work and your cultivation of the earth, it's it's beneficial. So you want to be beneficial. You want to be uh, among the people who do the most good. So we talked about. Tawheed, and the other thing that I, I think we need to address the spiritual crisis is, is, is balance or mizan. And me, this mizan is a method of applying justice. It's related to sustainability because we're, we're, we're not doing too much and we're not doing too little. We're, we're living in balance with the planet, with nature, with our environment. It's, 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 it's harmony. And I like to think of um, I like to think of us and Allah and nature in sort of a, like a love triangle. So we have Allah and we have humanity and we have nature. And Allah created the, the cosmos and within it galaxies and within it our solar system and within our solar system, our planet down to the smallest ant and the smallest atom, right? And the cosmos, the galaxy and nature and uh, our environment all contain signs for humanity. And these signposts point to Allah. And, and we have nature 
worshiping and praising Allah in ways that we can understand. Uh, there's um, uh, an ayah, it says uh, the seven heavens and the earth and whatever it is, whatever it is in them, um, exalt Allah. And there's nothing except that Allah, there's nothing that except it exalts Allah by his praise, but you do not understand the way of exalting. And the, the cosmos is, is, is sacred and it's, it's full of meaning. And both the cosmos, nature, uh, it's revelation. The cosmos and revelation, they both have the same author, right? And they both contain spiritual messages for humanity. So if we don't know our place in nature, much less the cosmos, we are bound to make decisions and take actions that cause harm to ourselves and to others. I don't know, perhaps humanity is more concerned with uh, its economic position in the material world rather than knowing its place in the cosmos. And, uh, and I guess we're more concerned with gaining rather than being, right? And then, uh, so we have we have a law, we have nature, and we have humanity here. And we see in the Quran that Allah shapes and molds Adam from clay, from an altered black mud, and then breathe of breathe into him of his spirit, and then created, you know, a mate Hawa in a similar nature, right? So. Even in the, the creation of Adam, we, we see how humanity is connected to the earth. Because Adam was made from clay, mud, right? And Allah uh, sends prophets and the revelation of the Quran to humanity. So we have this love triangle between Allah and humanity and nature and you know, nature and nature are signs for humanity pointing to Allah. So uh, humanity can look at nature and see these signs and be reminded of Allah. I like to think of, I like to think of a, that love, tri love triangle like that. So we have this triangle, this love triangle, but some, we're not given the love. Some scholars believe that the reason that we are experiencing a, a climate crisis is because we have a disconnect uh, in our relationship with Allah. We, we've misunderstood our place in the cosmos um, and, and we, we've relinqu relinquished our role as a Khalifa. Or, so instead of Khalifa, we, we become consumers. If, if we don't know who Allah created us to be, then we are literally being unjust to ourselves. People who embody qualities of the divine, they create a world that reflects the divine. So when we embody the divine quality of justice, al-adl, right? We manifest that justice into the world. We are we are harmonizing our reality with the ultimate reality, Allah. And, and, and instead of imposing our own reality. And when we, when we go against the reality of Allah, we are literally, literally being unjust to ourselves. So when we, Prepare our connection with Allah by embodying uh, Allah's divine qualities like justice and wisdom and forbearance and beneficence and graciousness. When we, we, when we embody these, these divine qualities, then we will see them manifested in nature. 
When we embody these divine qualities, not only will we, will we see a natural world that, that, is, that is beautiful, but inshallah, we will get the reward of being companions of the garden in the next world. So I'm, I'm calling people to go through a, like a spiritual jihad or echo jihad. And we have an amazing example of our Islamic tradition of how to use Quranic principles and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to care for and cultivate the earth. And I was introduced to, uh, to this again by Brother Ramis. And um, it's amazing. So the agricultural scientists of Muslim Spain, they developed the most expansive and beneficial agricultural system in history. And they did all of this without harming the soil. Their belief in the message of Allah and the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, gave them a, a deep respect for the value of water. They understood that the health of the soil was essential and needed to be restored. Um, and they used, they, they had composting down to a science. They knew that factory farming was not the way to go. They understood that smaller individual parcels of land owned by different people and managed by different people allowed the, the, the land to be farmed more intensively. So we have this, this, this uh, respect for water and re respect for the soil and allowing lots of people um, to have small farms. This, so for like almost 900 years, Muslim agriculturalists and, and farmers, they cultivated a, a, a land that literally sustained the religious and, and, and the religiously diverse and culturally diverse cities of Al-Andalus, you know, Muslim Spain. This is for 900 years. So the, the Islamic art of, art of agriculture, and it was definitely uh, an art. It provided a foundation for the other arts of the civilization from, from literature to commerce to flourish. So let's put this in contrast to, um, the industrial age. So in less than 300 years from the start of the industrial age in, in like the late 1700s, look at the plant, look at, look, at the, look at the state of the soil on our planet around the world. It's, it's steadily and swiftly degrading. Even, even things that are being grown are less nutritious. And there, there are places that can no longer be cultivated because they have been taken advantage of and, you know, for, um, what, for, for, for 300 years, right? So in this same way that the nature of the soil determines what can be cultivated, the composition of the heart determines how we can benefit our world. And we already have a wonderful example in our tradition in uh, Muslim Spain. And that is what justice looks like. When you can farm some land, not even just a little bit, a peninsula for 700 years and the soil is fruitful every single year, you're being, you're doing something right. That, that is what justice looks like. And the only reason, well, I'm not gonna say the only reason, but the reason that it stopped um, is that the Muslims 
were forced out of, of Spain. So I think, I just think that is an amazing example of uh, what, our, what, our, what our religion, what the Quran, what the Sunnah can do. So if, if justice is putting things in the right place, that means putting ourselves in the proper place as worshipers of Allah and as custodians of the earth. So in this way, we can do the most good. We can be a mercy to the world like our blessed, blessed prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I am encouraging myself and I'm encouraging all of us to cultivate a deeper relationship with Allah and with nature, to lean into to being rather than gaining, to lean into being a khalifa rather than a, than, than a consumer, to be just and to bring life to the ideals of justice and unity and balance as best as we can with the help of Allah. Inshallah. Dr. LaFair, Sister Corey, um, for just dropping so much wisdom in under 30 minutes and, and, and bringing, uh, you know, just so many questions, so many thoughts to the forefront, but really appreciate you um, just, you know, addressing this topic from a theological perspective, from a historical perspective, and uh, some of the questions that we're getting here now, uh, I'm sure you can see here. Uh, reflect some of this. So uh, if it's all right with you, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the questions, inshallah, and we can uh, make this part a little more interactive. Um, but the first question that we have uh, that was asked here was that, uh, are you aware of uh, permaculture principles in alignment with Islam? So I'm, I'm not a per permaculture expert, but I have learned from a permaculture expert, uh, Brother Ramis Kent. And um, the way he teaches permaculture, there are definitely lots of uh, alignment with Islam and permaculture. So that's as far as I can go, because I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm not, not well versed. Ramis, R, maybe someone could put it in the chat, but it's R H A M I S, and then Kent, K E N T. And um, yeah. If you have a, the opportunity to learn permaculture from him or learn about uh, Islam and um, as related to uh, stewardship and sustainability, take it, take his, take his course. Um, the next question we have is, uh, what, what are your top five practical tips to reduce environmental harm on a personal scale? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where I started. Um, what is it? Back in 2013, this is, this is where I started um, thinking about personal ways, you know, practical ways to reduce environmental harm. So, um, there was this Ramadan where um, I was waiting for, I was at the masjid and I'm waiting for the Adhan, right? And you know, at the masjid, um, it's been so long ago since I've been in a masjid, but um, there, there's a table and it's set out and they have like, you know, dates and banana, watermelon, you know, for you to break your fast. So uh, on that table, are, is filled with styrofoam cups full of, you know, stuff to break your fast with. And so people would take that cup, you know, after you hear the on and then um, break their fast and throw that styrofoam cup away. And so that cup was in use for less than a minute. And so from there, I was like, I need to make a change. I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. So I'm going to start with myself. So what I ended up doing was I ended up creating um, an iftar kit for my family, specifically for Ramadan. And so it had um, bamboo cutlery, 
and um, stainless steel tray and it had a, um, a reusable tumbler and a cloth napkin. And with my family, I have, I have five girls and uh, my family would take a bag of uh, our iftar kits to any iftar that we went to. So that's why I started using reusables. Um, not uh, staying away from single use anything. So that was that was my goal when I started during Ramadan is to stay away from single use anything, right? And to eat what was on my plate to to be less wasteful, less wasteful, wasteful. So that's my number one thing to use reusable, right? And I have a list on my website. Yeah, there's lots of lists, but I would do that one. Um, and I would also, beyond using reusables, in addition to using reusables, is to refuse. So um, I think you you could you should start there. So for example, let's say you're you're going to a restaurant and um, they offer you. Oh yeah, there's this there's this restaurant I like. It's called Elevation Burger. And when you order, there's a little there's a little box you can check that says, "Don't give me any napkins. Don't give me any straws. Don't give me any you know." So you can refuse. That way, you you start there. So refuse when possible. Reuse. That's another one. And let me see what's another one on my list. Hmm. Oh, uh, another one that I really like is to eat local and organic food as much as you can. So that may mean supporting your local your local CSA, or that may um, mean not eating strawberries in Canada because strawberries don't grow in Canada at this time of year. So just eating local organic food, something that's just close to home. It's usually healthier. And um, uh, right now I volunteer at a, uh, an urban farm. And in like in summer, I have the, 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 the blessing of eating tomatoes right off the vine. There's nothing that tastes better than tomatoes right off the vine. I actually have a sister who doesn't like tomatoes, but I brought her some tomatoes that had been picked that day, less than a mile from her. And she's like, oh, I like these tomatoes. So, you know, eating local, eating organic, using reusables, refusing. Thank you, Sister Corey. Um, another question we've got here is that uh, aren't there other like, uh, you know, polytheistic cultures like, uh, you know, even Native Americans before America was colonized that also had respect for the earth and working it rather than using it? Um, they had very sophisticated ways of farming and taking care of the land as well. I guess kind of a question, comment ish. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that they brought that up. So a lot of uh, indigenous cultures, you know, before colonization, um, the land, the, the native people of uh, the land that we're on now, um, they treated the land so well that for some reason, uh, settlers from Europe went there and was like, oh, this is new, untouched. No, <laughs> it's been well-maintained, well-maintained. Uh, so the native people of, um, uh, uh, what is now the U.S. Um, indigenous people in you know southern um, the southern Americas, um, indigenous people, um, the Aboriginal people of um, um, Australia. There's definitely lots of inspiration that we can take. So I, I'm a firm believer that um, um, knowledge is you know the property of of the believer. So wherever they there's some good knowledge that we can, an inspiration that we can take from indigenous people um, around the world. Absolutely. 
Definitely. Thank you. I think uh, the clarification as well was added that, you know, in, with respect as well to that, uh, it depends, I think the statement you made that depends on the relationship that we have with Allah, um, which, you know, in, in, with respect to uh, other cultures may, may not be the same case, but we still see that uh, the, these, this consciousness uh, manifesting that, that's there. Um, the other question that we see here as well is, uh, I've heard people say that we are being tricked by large corporations into thinking that small changes we make, uh, or the small changes we make can make a difference to the environment, uh, while they are polluting hugely and doing so much harm that ordinary people can't undo it. Uh, what would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Um, um, I agree. Large corporations are, um, definitely um, using uh, resources at uh, unsustainable rates, I agree. But what I would like to focus on is, okay, uh, so the question said that, you know, they're triggering us into thinking that the things that we do individually um, can make a difference when really maybe they can't, well, what I'm saying as Muslims, um, our, that we have to change our relationship with the law. And our relationship with the law will help us to be better, better stewards. So it's, it's, embodying you know the divine qualities of Allah will help us manifest those qualities not only in ourselves but also uh, on the on the earth and inshallah that will make a difference um I truly believe uh, I, I practice archery and um Archery has uh, definitely some lessons. So um, what I try to focus on is what I can do. Those are individual actions, right? Um, and also believe in the unseen, believe in the power of Allah. So I do what I can do. Uh, I practice hope rather than despair. And I also believe in Allah and believe in the power of Allah and believe in the unseen. So when you have a, a bow and you put your arrow on the bow, all you can do is aim and shoot. That's all you can do. Allah determines where that arrow lands. So I'm saying that we should focus on what we can do in our hearts, in our relationship with Allah, but also on the planet. And uh, if you focus on Allah, you will never ever be, be a loser. So we know the day of judgment is gonna come. Um, it could be the envir environmental crisis that takes us out, we don't know. But set our intentions to obey Allah, to be just, to fulfill our, our role as Khalifa and as stewards of the planet, and we're taking action spiritually and we're taking action uh, on the planet. And so with that combination, I, I just feel like we, we can't lose because we, we put our trust in Allah. No one, no one can lose if you put your trust in Allah. I love the way you put that. Um... And the, the other question that comes up here is, uh, you know, sister, are you still part of uh, the co-housing co network? Are there any up and running Muslim co-housing co-ops uh, type of places in North America or Muslim owned food co-ops or CSAs that people can know about or be aware of? Wow. Um, co-housing is, is a dream. So I'm not focusing on co-housing yet. But inshallah, it's all, it's always in my du'as. It's always in my du'as. And I, I, I believe there is a community in, I want to say New Mexico, 
that has uh, that has land and is encouraging people to to come to the land and live on the land. So um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but um, closer to me, um, um, I live in Maryland, but closer to me in Virginia, which is you know like this, is a, a family. Um, they're called Fitcher Farms, and Fitcher Farms. Um, provides you know fresh food and also um, milk and other products and then there's another family <laughs> family farm father in Virginia where I did my first uh, zabiha instead of like paying someone to do it for me that was a transformative event so there are there there are just in my area I'm just thinking of two right now but there's gotta there's got to be more. Yeah, go go find Shake Google and see what you can, what Muslim farmers and co-ops you can find, inshallah. Definitely, and uh, and and any any links that uh, people might come across, please drop them in the chat. We can send them out as well. Um, uh, one question comes up. Uh, thank you for mentioning the some of the historical examples within uh, Muslim history of uh, you know holding up this practice of. Uh, holding the environment sacred and agricultural practices and, and all that, especially with respect to uh, the example given in Andalus. Um, yeah, as we know in, in our history as well, uh, when these, uh, when, when these um, you know, Muslim uh, dynasties or, or caliphates had, had, you know, uh, had been defeated, uh, some of the conquerors, the uh, folks that, that had come in place of them would salinate the earth. Uh, would salinate the land mm -hmm. in which they uh, had occupied, as was the case with the Mongols in Baghdad um, and in other places around. Um, so how would you say that, would you say, just in a historical question, that, uh, that uh, context here, uh, would you say that um, the Muslim community, the Muslim Ummah for, for, for its history has kind of been uh, pivoted away from this uh, aspect of environmental care from traumatic events like this? Or uh, do you feel other reasons have kind of led us to not maybe keep environmental care front and center of our uh, compass and how we practice our faith? Uh, I think, um, you know, Muslims are human. And I think we've been in, uh, uh, infected by the virus of um, um, capitalism and white supremacy, um, I think we've been infected. I think we've even internalized these things because we're trying to go along to get along instead of being unapologetically you know, Muslim. Um, I think there is um, a bit of, I guess, scientism where we think science and technology is the answer um, rather than um, uh, the Quran and, and, and all the sciences that have developed from the Quran. So I think uh, Muslims, um, we, have our, we have our work cut out, cut out for us. We're, we're part of the planet, we're, we're human. And we've been, um, like I said, in, in, infected by a lot of the things that you know other humans have been infected by, you know, capitalism, as I said, uh, white white supremacy and uh, uh, hegemony. Um, yeah, we we've got we've got is our issues too, and that's why I say um, we need to rectify our relationship with Allah and with our, with our with our with our deen, with our religion, and also with nature. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, I think right around enlightenment, uh, the, the, the sacredness of nature, um, nature was desacralized. It's no longer seen as um, the creation of Allah. It's just seen as something to be conquered and, and, and subdued. And that, hasn't, that, that has affected us all. 
that's just for Corey. And uh, I think a point that you made uh, earlier with respect to the analogy of archery that, you know, there, it, you know, starts with us and there, there's at, at the least the, the, the basic thing we can do is, you know, point our arrows and, and shoot and have that, have that faith down line. Kind of how Zainab lifts up that uh, a small backyard garden is also just a beautiful thing to invest in, uh, you know, with, with us and uh, whether you're in the suburbs or anywhere you might be, uh, a way to stay connected to the earth. Uh, if you're in an apartment complex like me, maybe just getting a tomato plant and starting there and just getting, you know, some of your growing your own vegetables um, and, and, and starting a little bit small here. Uh, a question that, that was put here. Um, first off, uh, for the 40 green hadith, really enjoying um, it, have just been growing through it. Uh, I want to ask, uh, do you have a personal favorite uh, from your compilation of 40 green hadith or one that you find yourself often coming back to in your life's work? Yes. Um, I think my favorite um, is um, barely simple living is part of faith just keep it keep it simple um also um sometimes we we're we're, we're we are um absorbed in or we, we we just want progress we think progress is 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 the best way to go sometimes maintenance maintaining healing i think maybe all the time maintaining and healing and con and and being content is the way to go i think we've been tricked into thinking that progress and technology um is um will be our saviors uh, i think uh Brother Ramis, uh, he said um, that technology, all technology does is amplify what's already there. So if, if we are um, conquering nature and subduing nature, um, technology is gonna help us do that. So it, it really starts with our, with our hearts. Exactly, Sister Corp, that's beautiful. Uh, and the last question that we've got here, um, oh, I, I think we've got uh, one right here from uh, Sister Kristen that, uh, can you share, uh, how did you get started on this sacred work? Mm -hmm. I think um, my foundation for this work was spending the summers with my grandma on her farm in deep Alabama where there was like red clay roads and a stream and picking blackberries. I think um, that was where my sacred work started because I was, I was in, I was in harmony. I was, I guess, adjacent to the harmony because my, my grandmother, she, if there was a, a person who could be a, 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 a paradigm of harmony. I think it was my grandmother. So when it was time to plant, she planted. When it was time to let the soil rest, she rests. And she came inside and she made quilts out of, um, uh, she used fabrics to make quilt. So I think it started there. And then um, I got away from it. And then I had children and I had to do something, something different. And I, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that, that moment, that spark where, um, you know, I was in the masjid and I saw someone use a styrofoam cup for three seconds. And Allah just put into me that we gotta do something different. I think it started there. Thank for sharing that, Ms. Corey. Uh, and the last question that I've got here that was um, that was posted, and inshallah, I think with the time as well, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with this, uh, that your uh, bio shows that you've been able to work with the Muslim community in a variety of settings. Um, what has been, since kind of taking on this call and uh, doing the sacred work, uh, what have been some of your 
uh, what you would consider um, your greatest successes within the Muslim community, but also some of your greatest difficulties in uh, practicing the sacred, sacred work within the Muslim community? Well, let's see. It's definitely a jihad, I'll tell you that. <laughs> So habits are so hard, so hard to change. But um, um, I think I've learned to be um, to be patient, um, to believe in Allah and what Allah can do. Um, so one of the yeah, so so the challenge is, is is changing habits of whole entire communities. And I can't do that, but I know Allah can. So I'm just gonna keep, you know, trying to be an example. So um, a lot of time, and I know people get tired of me, but um, when they see me coming, they'll be like, uh-oh, here comes Sister Corey. I better recycle, <laughs> better recycle this water bottle. <laughs> so um, if I can be a reminder, if my presence can, can be a reminder to, to a uh, to people to be um, more, um, to walk more gently on the planet, um, to um, revive the, the, the sunnah of uh, sustainability, then alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, and uh, I guess one of the, uh, one of the best things um, that one of my best experiences was um, being invited to Abdu Sabur Farms and um, I got to experience like the spiritual aspects of, of, of Zabiha and be um, around a family that's been farming for generations and that um, where a shepherd, a shepherd of, the, of their flock has like a relationship with uh, the animals that they rear. It, it's not just, uh, they see the animals as, you know, a creation of a law and respectfully um, do the zabiha. So uh, I think that was one of my um, most beautiful uh, experiences. Jazakallah khair for sharing that, uh, Sister Corey, and, and so much, uh, so many others for, for answering our questions so beautifully. Uh, indeed, it is uh, a jihad, but you've definitely inspired us to uh, at least, you know, be able to, uh, you know, try and start that uh, change of habit, try and start that change of mindset at home. Uh, I think as you, as you lift it up beautifully, habits are a hard thing to break um, communally, but even just for ourselves. I think how we get conditioned in our society with things being more ease, uh, ease kind of driven, um, but also more detrimental to our environment. Uh, it's hard to break those habits. And as you lift it up that, you know, it's got to start with us um, before anything. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to let the audience know that you can uh, follow Sister Corey's work um, on uh, Instagram at Green Ramadan, uh, as well as uh, the website we put in the chat, uh, greenramadan.com. I uh, really appreciate everyone for being a part of the series and the conversations that we've been able to have uh, on, on topics of justice as they pertain to Islam and the verse in Surah Nisa. Um, and we would like to just uh, let y'all know that any uh, more information that you'd like with respect to Muslim space and upcoming events, uh, you can always check those out on our website. But again, Sister Corey, Jazakallah uh, for uh, an incredible time uh, with you today, uh, for the conversation, for the wisdom and the gems. And uh, as a teacher of mine says that uh, on any conclusion, inshallah, it's just a pause in our conversation. We're going to pick it up, especially with respect to the environment. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not a one and done. Uh, but I really want to appreciate you on behalf of the audience and for Muslim Space for being here with us tonight, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. Zakla khair, everybody, for, for coming. We'll make the recording uh, uh, available to everyone, uh, inshallah, just a little bit after the event. Uh, and inshallah, we'll see you at the next series when it comes up. But uh, you all have a blessed night and a good weekend up ahead, inshallah. And early Jummah Mubarak to you all. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.